Uh, it's truly a pleasure to be here. Um, I have to say, that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> oh, I said to Jason, I will not break into song. That I can assure you. <clears throat> and the, probably the biggest compliment I could give these, these, this young group of, of singers is that I did also get the chills up my spine. And it was as good as the seventh game of a National Ice Hockey League championship. <laughs> And I know that most of you probably won't get that, but, and I, I won't in, incorporate too much humor because I probably end up spending too much time trying to explain it to you because I have to say Australians have the neatest sense of humor. Canadians are far too dry. And so I will leave well enough alone. And I am dressed in red, white, and blue. It is the American flag, but I assure you, I am Canadian. And that gets a bigger laugh in Canada because it's the last line of a beer commercial, a very funny beer commercial. So that's the end of me trying to explain my Canadian sense of humor to you. I'm just tossing in a couple of pictures, my family. I threw in summer pictures for a reason because we are here in summer, right? Okay, okay. Um, I got the job down in Rainy River and I went for five years. What happened was I entered a board that was really, really collaborative. And my background, as I mentioned, the, the hockey thing, certainly involved in team sports most of my life. And collaboration in team sports, goal setting, all of those, those things really fit well with me going into this board. And so I returned in 2010 to find that we were still operating. And I'm not pointing fingers at people because I, too, was part of that leadership team. We were very prescriptive. Um, we had a board improvement plan that was 100 pages long. It was an annual plan. We created it every year. Each page had six to 10 specific strategies that we were to follow. And so you've got up to 1,000 things that you're going to follow in a year. It was a prescription. And it was a checklist. Every month, I would meet with the team that I oversaw. And at the end of our meeting, we'd go through the checklist. Did we do this? Did we do this? Did we do this? So I managed to convince the, the team that we would go to a board strategic improvement plan. And we narrowed it down to 12 pages. Much of it was data identifying the needs in our board. And the meat and potatoes of it were three priorities. And the three priorities were improving student achievement through a Authentic learning, so the student engagement piece. Assessment for learning, focusing on the Ontario Ministry of Education uh, growing success document, and early intervention. And we have in our board, our board is made up of 40% Indigenous students. When they come to our board, their language skills are greatly delayed in comparison to other kids who have been exposed to literacy uh, prior to um, prep. We talked about some other things in our board, but the concept of power over, that whole prescription piece to power with, was something that was really, really foreign to our staff. They were used to years of, of checklist. And all I have to do is go to the checklist and, and make sure that I get it done. Two things that we talked about uh, other than our board strategic improvement plan. We had a district review team that came in and they would sweep into a school. They were made up solely of administrators, senior administrators and principals. They'd sweep into a school for a day. Each of them would take classrooms. They'd go into classrooms for 20 minutes. They'd come back, they'd talk about what they saw. Later in the day, they'd go back into classrooms for 20 more minutes and they'd come back and talk about what they saw. And at the end of the day, they gave a verbal report to the school, followed up a a couple weeks later by a written report, and that report was the Bible that they were to follow for the rest of the year, until we returned to evaluate them again. Well, we talked about how really superficial that was, because the binder went on the, on the shelf, essentially, and they dusted it off two weeks before the team rolled in the next year, read a few things, and incorporated it into their daily activities, and they were supposedly growing. So we said, we have to change that. And I say we, there was a pro I have to be honest, there was a lot of me in the beginning. Um, there was a lot of, of, of trying to drag out some research to convince people that 
we had to go deeper in our system, and we had to bring a voice from within. And so the district review team process became a week-long process. And it wasn't made up strictly of administrators. We invited teachers. And we got some union kickback. Our union leaders, our teacher federations, didn't like it because they felt it was a valuation. And when the DRT team came to me and said, we're not going to have union or teacher involvement, I just said to them, we've invited them. It was an invitation. If they choose not to come, hopefully over time, we will see some involvement. So the first DRT visit, week-long visit, not a teacher. Not a teacher. The second one, we had one teacher, and we haven't looked back since, including the union president being involved in our DRT visits now. Because it's not a valuation. It's about open dialogue. It's about growing together. It's not about standing and telling somebody, uh, judging st somebody. The second piece that we looked at was the professional development philosophy. We were a stand and talk board. What I'm doing with you today, right now, you'll walk away with 10% of what we've talked about here. And so we talked about if, if authentic learning is important for kids, and we made it our priority, then why isn't it important for adults? So we took all of our central PD money, and we still do a little stand and talk, but we took most of our uh, central PD money and we farmed it out to the schools. And we said, this is release time for teachers. If two teachers want to grow together and one teacher is an expert and the other has the courage to step up and say, I need help, and that's the other message we've really been promoting in our board, it's actually a strength to admit that you need to grow, that you want to grow, and you look to somebody else to help you. And so the money went to the schools, and we used it for release time. Now, there's a little bit more than it's not quite that simple. Um, I'll get into some structures that we put in place. Building relationships uh, and developing people are built on many of the things that Lynn talked about this morning. All right, Trust being one of them. And I am the only employee of this group right here, the trustees of the board. Everybody else works with me in the board, but those people supervise me. And at the time of this job coming open, um, I was three weeks into radiation. I'd undergone surgery. Some of you, if I turn this way, I look very Hollywoodish. I've had a bit of a nip and tuck here on the left-hand side of my, my neck. I had 42 lymph nodes removed, one of them being cancerous. And at the time that the job came open, I was three weeks into radiation. I sent my application in in that third week. And four weeks after my last radiation treatment, I was hired by this group of trustees. And what a great word, trustees. I was honored, honored to have been hired in this, in really in the situation that, that I had, had been through. And so you can be well assured that the relationship that I have with those trustees, and it was based on my 20 years prior, I knew all of those trustees, so they really knew what they were getting when, when they hired me, and I was very thankful that they hired me under the circumstances that, that existed. The principals I'd all worked with over the years. Staff and unions, I knew all the union leaders, so the relationship built on trust really was there. And this board, I honestly felt when I arrived, was ready for some kind of change, some kind of building voice. Superintendent development, I told the two superintendents, uh, another saying in Canada is you're getting along in the tooth because we have a beaver and the teeth keep growing on the beaver. Well, I use that saying, I'm long in the tooth. I'm probably retiring in a year or two. And so I told the two superintendents that we will have conversations that I wouldn't normally have with superintendents, but I'm preparing them for my departure. And one of them, because we live in the north, one of them will certainly take over. The daily conversations and messaging, I started right away, and our team started to talk about sense of family. So imagine a small board, we're 5,000 kids, we're probably 12 to 15 communities scattered over a large geography. It takes six and a half hours to drive from one end of our board to the other. And I start walking in and talking about sense of family. How do you build sense of family with that? Well, one person doesn't. So we started looking at the senior team. What does sense of family really mean? Well, sense of family, as far as I'm concerned, families just talk openly. 
they love one another, and, and they can say what's on their mind. And so we kept it that simple. This is a, a, another foundational piece. Once you, you're, you're working on those relationships, in order to develop the organization, um, Hargraves and Fullen talk about um, professional capital. Professional capital is made up of human capital, social capital, and decisional capital. And it's the social capital that really helps build the human capital. The individual teachers, if they're socially collaborating, they can't help but get better. And so we worked on some of the stuff that uh, Ken Leithwood, he's a Canadian researcher, and, and John Hattie, and I've heard Hattie's name tossed around here, so I'm not even going to go into the Hattie stuff. Um, but Leithwood talked about four pathways. The rational pathway, that's the problem-solving logical uh, pathway. The emotional pathway, that's all the EI that Daniel Goleman talks about. Uh, the organizational pathway, those are the structures that we put in place to help with the collaboration. Because you can't have teachers collaborating if all they're doing is teaching every day, all day. It's a tough thing to do. And then the family pathway. And the family pathway, I tried to view as building it on the same five practices as our leadership piece. Our adults, our parents, should be setting direction. Right? They should have goals. We have uh, parent advisory committees. They should be trying to engage and identify what's important for their kids in the system. All right? They should be building relationships with staff members and themselves. They should be developing their own understandings of good instruction. And there should be some form of accountability for parents as well. So that whole piece uh, was something that was really lacking in, in our board, the whole family uh, piece. Changing structures and roles, uh, we worked out collaboratively. I'm going to jump down to this piece when I talk about the changing structures and roles. Our literacy coaches are coaches who are in each of our elementary schools, and they're freed up full time. Their job is to go in and work alongside teachers and help build capacity. All right, and they, they work, they meet every month, and they talk about good strategy as well. But our curriculum SATs had a different role. They were central office people, and they were supposed to be experts in curriculum. And our special education SATs were also central people, and they were involved in special education. We started talking about this, but really learning for any child is just on a bit of a continuum. And so every one of these people should actually become a team and work as a team to build student achievement. So that's what we said we wanted from them. And then we let turn them loose and let them try and define their roles. Our Aboriginal advisor was a person who advises or advised at the time the director only. Well, I can't sit down daily with an Aboriginal advisor, even though she's a fabulous, fabulous lady. So we talked about her getting into each school and building that relationship to start with with principals. Because with 40% First Nations in our schools, we needed to have First Nation content embedded so that the First Nation kids felt like they were part of something. And that's been a long-standing thing. I don't know about Australia, but in Canada, it's really been a long-standing thing where First Nation people do not feel like they are part of the education system. Now, these are the structures in developing the organization. Leithwood talked about the, the organizational side of things. These are the actual structures. PLCs, I don't have to tell you about. Uh, in elementary, we were uh, running PLCs every four to six weeks the first year. We were just dabbling in what we call cycles of inquiry. And a really quick sample, example of a cycle of inquiry is, say, an oral language um, cycle of inquiry. And we start our cycle of inquiry. It's based on four to six weeks. It's based on good research. And we do an if-then statement. So the if-then statement might be, if we use small group instruction to generate discussions and get kids to justify their thoughts and opinions, then comprehension skills and levels should improve. And so we employ strategies, and we get teams of teachers together in their PLCs and talking about the strategies that they can employ. And we collect data throughout. And at the end of the cycle of inquiry, hopefully, we've seen some improvement. And in the first year, we were really in our preliminary stages of, of dabbling with it. But we did have some priorities in the first year. I mentioned oral language. Our Aboriginal kids and kids with low SES, uh, not being exposed to literature, were coming in 
with very low levels, and we were finding that we weren't closing gaps very well. And so we really focused on developing the oral language skills based on comprehension so that reading and writing um, development would follow suit. And it only makes sense. If you think about what you're saying, you're going to think about what you're reading and, and, and writing. So we were building the comprehension right uh, as the kids were entering school. Triple P, that's really the um, Carmel Cravola, uh, Michael Full, and Peter Hill um, breakthrough book on uh, precision professional development driving the personalization of instruction. Because we are really focusing on personalizing the instruction for our students in KP. Assessment for instruction, that's really our second priority. Uh, HOTS is higher order thinking skills, comprehension, metacognition, that kind of thing. Small group instruction, very difficult concept for teachers to grasp. Because um, equity doesn't mean the same for all. And if we're going to close gaps, there are certain kids we have to focus on. And so we would group our, our, our kids who were struggling with oral language skills, as an example, and get into some more direct small group instruction. And we'd have to have activities for the other kids in the classroom. And at first, when we started, the activities were fairly general, fairly bland, if you wish. A little bit of black line master over here and a little bit of this over there. And we started, uh, in the, as I move on, I'll talk a little bit about some of the things we insisted upon. And uh, differentiated instruction, DI, and scaffolding is just building on. I, I probably don't need to go into all of that. But we did insist on this last thing, the literacy block in primary, because we believed that if we could get our kids reading at grade level by the end of grade three, we just made a better future for them. The city of Chicago predicts the number of jail cells they need in the future by the number of kids who are failing grade three. And I hate to say it, but it's pretty accurate. Our First Nation kids in Canada, it's a very small percentage of our overall population. But if you go into jails, it's a huge percentage of, of that population. The answer is education, and the answer is to get kids to read by the end of grade three. So we insisted on a, a two-hour literacy block in the morning with balanced reading, balanced writing. This is the Ontario School Effectiveness Framework. Um, you can get that off the Ontario website, but it's essentially, if you have a quick scan of that, that's kind of also what we're embedding in our system. And uh, the middle piece here, principals and teachers working together to align instruction with the school improvement plan, our board strategic improvement plan, the cycles of inquiry. Uh, it's Robinson's work. Uh, Robinson demonstrated that principals as instructional leaders and working with staff have a large impact on student achievement. And in our first year, our principals kind of divested themselves of that role because we had the literacy coaches in each one of our schools. And so they kind of stepped back and did the management thing and let the literacy coaches continue. These were the needs that we identified in our first year. Primary literacy, I've touched upon that, HOTS, high expectations for all students. I can honestly say when I arrived there, we had teachers who thought that First Nations kids, Indigenous kids, couldn't learn like other kids. And we had to talk about the fact that there's only one difference, and it's exposure to literature. And we've proven that we can close gaps, and we've got kids reading very, very well, and, and our graduation rates have, have increased quite dramatically as well. Differentiated in, 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 uh, intervention to support students. I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. And attendance. Um, we've got a five-year pattern of attendance that has not been very good. And I've checked around with all of our neighboring boards, and we're seeing the same thing. And some of it is just simply parents thinking it's OK to pull your kid out on a Thursday afternoon and go to a hockey tournament for the weekend. And as much as I love hockey, um, being a good hockey player isn't going to get you very far in life. So we've, we've got some work to do with that. Our differentiated in, uh, intervention piece, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I'm just going to talk in, in general about it. It's about teams of teachers supporting kids who are falling behind. Because what it's done for us is it's increased the responsibility of teachers for all kids in the school. It's not just Jack McMaster with his 20 kids in his class. And, and we do have lots of classes with 20. Our primary classes are capped at 20. 
So JK to grade three, they're capped at 20. Um, so a teacher would be responsible for 20 kids. But that's not how we wanted it to operate. We wanted, if we had kids who were struggling and were asking teachers to ask other people for help, that that's a strength, then we needed a team of teachers who could get together and provide some strategies. And again, the strategies were based on a lot of the Hattie's work as well. But it's one thing for John Hattie to tell us what works. It's another thing to really try and implement those things. And for one kid or one class, a certain strategy might work well, but it may not be what fits that teacher or another class. So we had a number of strategies that we were using, and teachers were sharing them with staff to help improve student achievement. Securing accountability. Uh, this was at the end of our first year. Uh, I called job embedded, embedded professional learning positive accountability because there's absolutely no way that Jack McMaster and Jason Clark are working together. And Jason says to me, I'm asking him for his help. And he says to me, yeah, come into my class and I'll, 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 I'll model some things for you. There's no way that Jason's going to let me down. And if I am somewhat reticent to go in, Jason's going to make sure that I do go in because he wants to help me. And that's the culture that we've been trying to build based on positive accountability. Marker student data. We insisted in the first year that every teacher in elementary identify four kids in their class. Level one, level two, level three, and level four. We didn't base it on DRA. We didn't base it on reading levels. Because you might not even have to have a teacher in a class, and your DRA scores are going to go up. Patty will tell you that. So kids can still be improving, but they may always, from grades one to eight, be in level one. The idea for us was accelerated learning. We wanted to see kids who were in level one go to level two. Level two is at grade level. If we can get, to all, if we can get all of our kids to level two by the end of grade three, we've just made a better life for them. And the research proves it. So that's why we were using levels instead of just an assessment score, like a DRA or an OLA. Focus school, I mentioned the um, uh, focus school visits, the week-long visits with our DRTs. Our oral language, uh, we did an oral language project for five years. Uh, the ministry funded it. And um, we convinced them because of our Aboriginal students. And we, sh we demonstrated to the ministry, and I'll show you our slide, uh, the slide in just one second, of the impact that we had with the oral language project. Principles accountability, I said earlier, we essentially ignored it. Um, we had the literacy coaches in there. We thought that the principals, and, and some of, don't get me wrong, some of our principals got heavily involved with the literacy coaches and really worked as a team. But probably over half of them just said, I got an expert in here, I'll step back. And that wasn't what we wanted. Uh, we have three uh, trustee updates a year, and they're trustee updates at public board meetings. We want to be as transparent as we possibly can. And one of the things that we changed in our second year is another saying in Canada is blowing smoke up somebody's behind. You know, you tell them all the good stuff, but you never go near the, the bad stuff. Well, in our second year, we just stopped doing that. If we needed to improve in a certain area, we talked to the public about it, and we explained to the public how we were going to do it. I think you gain much more public confidence by doing that than trying to hide things. OK, year one evidence. We improved in our provincial uh, examinations, grade 3, 6, 9, and 10. In all of them, we approved. Our marker student data showed uh, accelerated growth. Our Aboriginal graduates, uh, as I said, they're not huge numbers. In 2006, we had 82 uh, Aboriginal graduates. Last year, uh, in, in 2010, 97, and then last year, or the year before last, 2011, 1, or 113. We haven't quite. Uh, counted our numbers yet this year. How do we know? We were the first board in Ontario to create a self-identification policy for First Nation, Métis, and Inuit students. And at first, we got a lot of flack. Oh, here you go again. You're just, you know, just another number. You're just, it's going to be another study on, on Indians, is what we were hearing. And then when we sat down and we explained to them, we don't want to wait 12 or 13 years to find out that another First Nation has dropped out of school. We want to be able to collect data while you're in prep or kindergarten for us and be able to do instruction for learning. And by the way, we will share the data with you. And 
All of the boards in Ontario now have self-ID policies, and we're starting to see some gains with our First Nation uh, students in learning. Um, I'll have a couple of quotes later on for teacher voice, and the oral language focus uh, impact is this slide. This was the EQAO assessment in 910, and it was our fifth year of, of doing the oral language project. In, uh, this is all grade three, so grade three reading gain in 0910 as compared to the previous year, writing and math. The province, whoops, let's go back. The province gained 3%. Now I've got Noel average. What is Noel? Noel is a group made up of the eight boards in our region. And the, all eight boards were involved in the oral language project. So the Noel average was double the provincial average in reading, more than uh, double in writing, and we were on the positive side in math at least. However, the focus school average, and these were the schools that the Noel or the oral language uh, facilitator went in and worked extensively in each of the eight boards. We didn't really look at that at first, and then it dawned on us, hey, we haven't looked at the, at the, the school results for the focus schools. 17%, 12.1%, and even in math, 7.6%. Because we know in math, or maths here, in maths, that language is really part of, a part of math now. It's so language-based. And this has convinced us that oral language is not only for our primary kids, oral language is going right through to grade 12 now, and comprehension, justifying thoughts and opinions and, and the whole metacognitive piece about what you're saying. The BSIP review, um, we brought a committee together at the end of our first year, and I'm moving into year two, but we brought a committee of teachers together to, to give us feedback on our BSIP. And they walked into the meeting and said, why do you only want input from 12 of us? We've got 400 teachers out there. If you really want input, why don't you come to the schools and sit down with us? So our senior team did that. We divided ourselves up. And in noon hours, we went to every one of the schools. We brought in lunch. And we asked staff to come and give us feedback. And they did come and give us feedback, about 25% of them. You know, some weren't prepared to give up their lunch, and I certainly understand that. But 25% of the staff showed up, teachers, EAs, secretaries, principals. Oh, no, pardon me. We kept our principals separate because we had a, a principal, uh, three principal input sessions as well. So they gave us feedback. The first thing they told us was 12 pages was too much. You have three priorities. You don't have to show us the evidence. We know the evidence. And so we trimmed it down a little bit. We took their feedback. They wanted the same priorities. They felt that they, it was coherent for them and that they could align their school improvement plans with our board strategic improvement plan. The school improvement planning process, Jack, you keep hitting the right button, or the wrong button. It is the right button on here. School improvement plan with principals. Our principals, uh, many of them understood the school improvement planning process, but we still had a couple of them who just kind of liked to do it themselves. And then they bring it to staff, and the staff were comfortable with that. Sure, bring me the school improvement plan, and I'll, I'll, I'll do it. But it didn't fit with our philosophy of collaboration and of building voice from within the system. And if staff are OK with it, are they really owning it? And so we, we did a whole session with our principals on the process of school improvement planning. Who did we use? Not us, not the senior team. We used principals in our system who were good at it. And others were comfortable coming and asking them a question. So we're trying to open up that whole dialogue piece. Um, and then last thing. At the end of uh, year one, I challenged our principals to build culture laterally now. We were seeing the culture in the school's building of collaboration and caring, but I wanted to see, because we are a big board and we have more than one school in many of our communities, I wanted to see the lateral capacity building coming along. Because if we were going to get to a sense of family, we had to get schools talking to one another as well. In year two, in the building relationships piece, just very quickly, um, the union piece, um, we had negotiations pending. We wanted to get to interest-based problem solving and interest-based negotiating instead of just coming in with a position and each of us having a huge document that would take 
many, many days to walk through. So we invited all of our union leaders in, and we had Queen's University come in. We did a two-day workshop on interest-based problem solving. We started negotiations in, se in September. Stay tuned. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Because I, th I, I think it was Glenn who said this morning, or it might have been Lynn who said, often when things get stressful, you revert back to what you knew. And I'm quite hopeful that we don't revert back to the position piece. We volunteered for a provincial pilot on uh, the superintendent's performance appraisal. As a director, I do pr performance appraisals with the superintendents. So what I did is I went to the trustees and said, you do a, a, a performance appraisal with me. Let's use this process so that I understand the process. So we did, the trustees did a performance appraisal with me first, and then I started working with the superintendents on performance appraisals. And it's all about growth. It's not about top-down stuff. And our Aboriginal advisor in year two had started to develop relationships with principals, but we had a high school that was not so comfortable with the First Nation kids in it. And so we brought the Aboriginal advisor and put her in as a deputy, if you wish. And she worked very closely with the principal and teachers. And she started getting into focused conversations with teachers in classes and helping support different forms of learning and imparting some of the Aboriginal ways with the teachers. And it's quite a different school. It's only been a year. But we are finding pockets of very good success. And I'm a believer that you go to pockets of success and, and build on them. Um, trustees and budgets, developing the organization. Our trustees, for five years, had overspent their budget line. Now remember, these people are my bosses. And I'm sitting in a meeting with them and trying to convince them that if we're going to be transparent and accountable to the public, you can't be the people who make the decision on an $80 million budget and overspend your budget line every year. It's just, you know, if you're overspending your budget line, it's coming out of classroom. And so what we did is we actually sat down and we redefined our, uh, our methods for having meetings. And we used to meet twice a month, face to face, have a big dinner, have our meeting and people would go and if it was late at night, people would stay overnight in hotels and stuff. We cut it down to one meeting a month and we did video conference on the other one. And we will be under our budget line and that's all it really took. But if we're going to be transparent and we're going to demonstrate to the system that we too want to contribute, then the trustees had to really tighten up on their line. Our principals meetings in year two went from administrivia, management meetings, to them having PLCs because if we expect PLCs in schools, why wouldn't we expect it with our principals? And I'll mention later on that we also did it with us as a senior team, meeting once a month and looking at strategies at work rather than just the recent memo from the ministry that we can pump out anyways. Um, Leading the instructional program, the whole idea behind the PLCs with our principals was to help develop the instructional leadership piece, to get them back into classrooms and, 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 and focusing on working with teachers so that, so that they're not sitting in the office and doing you know, all of those distractions that, that come your way. I was a principal once, and I remember the memo after memo coming in and feeling like you never did get to a classroom because you were too busy answering stuff. Uh, from your board or from the Ministry of Education. We insisted on uh, not only 120 minute, uh, minutes of literacy blocks, but we insisted on whole, whole small, whole instruction. So meaning you introduce the concept to the whole class, and then you deepen the understanding by working with small group instruction. And then you revisit at the end of that to ensure that the class is getting it. We really extended our cycles of inquiry. I've explained that concept. Um, the role of the principal in instructional leadership was really emphasized there, and the global messaging was done. I don't know if you've read uh, Malcolm Gladwell's Tipping Point. That's the concept we're trying to get at here. A whole bunch of little things coming together to move us to uh, great gains in student achievement. <clears throat> Securing accountability, uh, the senior team's accountability to the system of the communities, the whole presentation, public presentations, us getting involved in PLCs and making sure the system knows that we're doing our own PLCs as well. So we're modeling for the system. We continued with the marker student data. 
Uh, we've focused on the principles of accountability and the influence as leaders. So it wasn't just building instructional leadership. Our two superintendents split the schools up in year two and made their personal goal implementation. So they went in once a month to every school. They sat down with the principal and they said, show me your school improvement plan. Show me the evidence of student learning, of growth. But that wasn't the end of it. They then said, now that we've looked at the evidence, let's go walk through the classrooms because I want to see the evidence that you just gave to me in the classroom. And if we didn't see success criteria up on the walls, if we didn't talk to a teacher to say, have you been working with your kids and identifying specific goals for individual kids? Are the kids aware of their own specific goals in, for their learning? Because if kids aren't aware of the goals or success criteria, I think, Glenn, you mentioned, there's no purpose, there's no focus. And so we were building that into it as well. Kids monitoring their own progress. We wanted teachers to ask kids, how do you think you're doing? Where do you think you are in this, in this piece, in this cycle of inquiry? And being able to target their own progress and reflect on what they're doing in class. We talked about visible learning, and again, Hattie's concept, of ensuring that teachers allow enough time to watch kids work in class instead of talking for the whole period, and then sending the homework home. How do you ever know if the kids are learning? Uh, I talked about my performance appraisal. Um, the trustee presentations continued, and the concept of teacher accountability continuing in our system. Uh, the, the current status, our principals are recognizing their role in the school now as instructional leaders. Number one priority. That memo to Jack McMaster, Director of Education, can wait. But I want to see principals getting in and getting into classes, working alongside teachers, asking those kinds of questions that help deepen learning. And this is just an example of uh, one of our PLCs where the principals are working together and they're working off charts. Um, we talked about the role of the principal as facilitators and, 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 and developing focus. The facilitation piece is to know your staff well enough. I mean, we expect teachers to be personal with their kids and know their kids and DI and the whole shebang. Principals should know their staff well enough to be able to have those open conversations and facilitate the growth amongst members or between schools. The focus piece, right? We only have three priorities in our board. If stuff is coming at us that isn't, that, that isn't part of one of our priorities, get rid of it. And we've given our principals permission to say no. That's part of the whole buffer piece, right? You folks, leaders in schools, you know how much comes at you. You know, it's National Walk Your Dog Week, anything like that. We get that stuff all the time. We get people wanting to do surveys all the time. Our principals say no. People will phone me, and I will say, I give you permission to contact the principal. That's it. The principal has the right to say no. And they have the right to say no to me. And if they convince me that it's not part of the board direction, I'm backing away. The bridging piece. When they're working with their school improvement plans, there are certain directions that they are going to go in. And if something comes from the ministry that's a money bomb, we have lots of money bombs in Ontario. They just, uh, the ministry comes out with an announcement, here's $50,000, do you want to try this? And if it fits in with the principal's and staff's direction, it's their job to help bridge that piece, get the money and incorporate it into a cycle of inquiry. Our current status, we have pockets of successful implementa implementation. I'm not going to blow smoke up your behinds today. We still have lots of work to do. We still have a lot of work to do. But we are building a culture of collaboration and caring. Uh, we are changing beliefs. Our week-long oral language stuff and our week-long DRTs are helping teachers understand that there is a new direction that we're going in. Uh, the work of uh, DeFore and Marsano is a, a quote, is simply just saying that good leaders, and I'm not talking about Jack McMaster as director of education. Leadership is everywhere in our board of education. It could be a group of students working together and one of the students empowering the others. It could be a teacher in a classroom. But it, Leadership helps people feel that they can do more. Um, 
year two review. I mentioned at the end of year one, we, had, we, we got challenged to go out to the schools and get feedback from the staff. Well, we went again this past uh, May and June. 75% participation. Went from 25% to 75%. And the only explanation I can have is that the teachers and, and, the, and the rest of the staff felt they had a voice. They felt that they, it was worthwhile sitting down with us and talking about the direction we were going as a board. Loose tight leadership. The neat thing about loose tight leadership is we set our direction with our board strategic improvement plan. But we're getting feedback from everybody in the board. So everybody in the board owns those three priorities and the strategies that we're employing. In year two, we identified a bunch of uh, Hattie strategies with our staff because we wanted our staff to be involved in, in understanding the Hattie strategies. So they're incorporated into our, our BSIP. So that's tightness because the whole board believes in the direction that we're going in. They contributed it. The looseness is every school is different. We've got one school in Sulaco with 84% First Nation, Aboriginal. It's going to be very different from a school in Kenora that has a very low percentage of uh, low SES and Aboriginal students. So they set their direction through their school improvement plan and align it with our board strategic improvement plan. This is a grade 12 student, and really what he's saying is the best thing about Dryden High School is the teachers care. They go out of their way, whether you're needing academic support or life's getting in the way of learning, they'll go out of their way. And this is a really special school. It's a, it's a close-knit group of staff, and it's a staff that we're doing some piloting with so that we can grow our other secondary schools. These are teacher voices. Uh, this is the BSIP feedback that we were getting. The first three are the good, and the last two are the bad and the ugly. It's a bit of a Clint Eastwood movie here. Um, PLCs are slowly coming together. They're recognizing that the structures are in place and that they're starting to get it, but there's more work that they need to do. Um, community culture is important. We want students uh, to want to be at school. They're talking about authentic purpose, about engaging kids in real learning. The second last one, no more KP6. That was the stand and talk approach that we took. They wanted it gone, for good reason. It did build a little foundation, but it wasn't that effective. PLCs need more precision and less principle driven. I probably could have identified the schools um, where the, the, the principals, just as developing their school improvement plans in PLCs, they were still kind of taking the, the lead instead of dispersing the leadership. And we have had difficult conversations with some of our principals about those kinds of things. Um, our evidence, our data. We were the lowest performing board. I, when they hired me, I didn't know that, but the, the year they hired me, we were the lowest performing board in grade three reading in the province. There were 71 boards in the province. In the last two years, we've improved 16%. In grades three and six, there's reading, writing, and math in each, so there's six assessments. Last year, in three of the six assessments, we've had the highest results we've ever had in 15 years since we started EQAO. In the fourth one, second best. In five and six, fourth best. Did we run out to the public and say, hey, look at us, we're doing great? Even though we improved year one and we've improved year two, we celebrated internally. Because we believe that you need to have about five years of, of evidence. You need a pattern of improvement that's greater than two years. So as happy as our trustees were with the results, we're about in September to get year three results. And I'm quite hopeful that we'll see improvement in year three. <clears throat> Other evidence, grievances from the unions have, have gone down. We're problem solving now instead of position taking. Um, our staff, if, when our superintendents go into schools to, to do the walkthroughs, our staff go in, and if they haven't been in a class, the staff come out in the hallway and bring them in because they're proud of what they're doing. And it's no longer an evaluation. They want the superintendents to see the kind of work that they're doing. A Lakewood custodian, Jeff Elcock, he runs a noon hour group for students. It's activities, it's, uh, he's got a little weight station set up for them, he's got uh, reading centers, he's got um, gaming in another corner. Um, he's a custodian, for goodness sakes. I learned about it on the radio. 
Open Roads teacher invited, two teachers invited me in and ran a proposal by me. Um, if it's coming from the grassroots, you can be pretty well assured that I'm going to try and make it happen. Because we're, we're, we're all about trying to develop that voice. Um, this is just a, the uh, new perspective on the uh, Ontario Leadership Framework. And the piece I want to point out is, this is what we've added, the personal leadership resources. Right? I talked about the five practices and how they're related. We're all about human beings interacting. Every one of those is related because human beings have to influence other human beings, I think, in order to improve an education system. So there's the cognitive, okay, the problem-solving piece, the social, that's the um, um, EI piece and the collaboration piece, and the psychological. That's about um, optimism, it's about self-efficacy, and it's about resilience. All right? If you can identify people in your system who are optimistic, who believe they can make a difference, and who are the ones who step up in the tough times and say, come on, you guys, let's pull this together. We can do this. Encourage them to have voice, because they will influence many, many others in your system. I will skip this. This is really a board perspective. And just a quote from uh, Jonathan Cohen. <clears throat> it's just about building culture in your system, in your school. It's about identifying your needs and working together as a group based on good research, I will add. <clears throat> um, visible learning from a student perspective. I kind of touched on that, the success criteria. Kids need to know what it takes to improve. We don't do that to athletes. Right? When we're coaching athletes, we're constantly giving them feedback. Well, we should be doing the same thing with our kids. Visible learning for staff is very much like visible learning for students. Right? Getting together and, and, and dialoguing about what good practice uh, is. And from a principal's perspective, it's just getting in with staff, in hubs, in those kinds of things. And the last thing I want to say is we must welcome the belief that we are all learners and we have to value our students as well. Next year, we're infusing $2.3 million into our uh, board with technology for students. Every student from grade 4 to 12 will have a laptop, and students in the primary divisions will have iPads. And our IT department is really small. So we couldn't figure out how, number one, we could support all the kids getting new equipment, and number two, heaven forbid, the teachers who are going to have to work with these kids and who may not be actually fluent in IT. And it was the IT department that said, well, why don't you talk to the principals? We have co-op learning placements for students in, in schools. We have peer tutoring, where kids get, get credits for tutoring others. Well, why wouldn't we just use kids to get credits to tutor other kids with IT and tutor teachers with IT? So that's where we're headed. Our IT department will be working with kids and supporting kids and teachers in their learning. And I just think that that's hugely powerful in a system. When we start welcoming kids as teachers, then we're moving somewhere. <clears throat> just an example of a gallery walk in feedback session. And really, we do have the authority to set the conditions for learning. Every one of us does. And every student does. And the choice for voice is absolutely crucial. And I leave you with one last picture. I warned you about winters in Canada. There you go. Picture on the left is the road that my wife and I drive across every winter. It's a lake. It freezes a meter deep. We started driving across it December 13th and finished March 13th. Those are ice fishing shacks. That is just frost on the edge of the lake in the morning. And the days are from about 8 o'clock in the morning to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So we really enjoy summer. Thank you. I appreciate being here. If I can answer any of your questions about some of the things that I mentioned here this, uh, this afternoon, I'll be around for the rest of the day. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you.